Hello, options traders. Welcome, everyone. Well, it was another wild week on Wall Street. No surprises there for the week ending January 4th of 2019. So I thought it was only fitting to do a follow on video to the previous one I did on implied volatility. So today let's talk about the volatility risk premium. So to succeed with options, you have to understand there is a risk premium attached to every single option. So I want to go over why that's there and how to identify it. But more importantly, I want to show you how you can mitigate that risk for better success. So let's take a look at the volatility risk premium. First of all, understand that in the long run, options are overpriced. And that may come as a little bit of a surprise when I've talked about fair value and other topics in previous videos. But in the long run, all options, calls and puts are expected to be overpriced. And that's really true of any type of an insurance market and options are a form of insurance. So whether you're talking about homeowners insurance, auto insurance, health insurance, they are all overpriced compared to what you get. Why? Because the seller is not going to sell anything at fair value. Nobody wants to sell something worth $5 if all they're expected to receive is $5. They might sell it to you for $5.50. And of course, that doesn't necessarily guarantee a profit but at least it gives them an incentive to be the seller. So in the stock market, stocks return about seven to 10% per year. 2018 was not one of them. I think we lost about 7% at the end of the year, but typically you should expect a positive return in the market somewhere around seven to 10%, depending on the time period measured. But option premiums run about 20% or more. Now in the last, three months or so, they're going to be a lot more because of all the volatility. But even in a quiet market, you can expect them to run about 20% or more. So it doesn't make sense to buy an option at 20% on an asset that's probably going to move seven to 10%. That is a losing deal in the long run. Now, before you turn the video off and say, well, what point is there to trading options? I will show you how you can alter that. And that's why it's important to understand how to do this. But when I talk about options, I'm talking about the at the money option. That is the truest option on the board. And that's the one that's going to carry the largest premium. So let's go over to the E-Trade platform and take a look. I'm going to use Apple as an example. On Friday, it closed at 148 and change here, up over six bucks. And it doesn't matter which expiration, I'm going to pick the February 2019 that has 41 days to expiration. So with the stock at 148, let's come down here to the 150 strike right here. And I can also see that is the at the money strike by looking at the extrinsic value in this column. It's got the highest extrinsic value here, $6 and change. And the extrinsic value is what makes it an option. So the at the money option is the truest option on the board. It has the most uncertainty and therefore it has the most insurance value and therefore people are willing to pay the biggest extrinsic value or the time value for that option. Well, just how big is this? Well, let's take $6 and let's say 17 cents divided by the stock price of 148.26. And that's going to give us just over 4%, about 4.2%. However, interest rates or premiums are always done on an annualized basis. That is only for 41 days. So to really put it on an annualized basis, we need to say how many 41 day periods are there in a year? So if we take 360 divided by 41, we get an annualization factor of about 8.8. .8. In other words, there are 8.8 41 day periods in a year and multiply that by our option risk premium, it's closer to 37%, about 36 and a half percent on a stock that's probably going to return seven to 10%. That's a big premium. All right, so why is this premium here? Why do option sellers command such a large premium? One way is to think about your profit and loss diagrams. Here we're looking at a long $50 call in green. And I can see it's a 50 strike because that's where my bend is. And the maximum loss is over here at $5. But notice that that is the most I could ever lose. That's why the graph flattens out here. But if the stock price rises above 50 at expiration, I can make an unlimited amount of money. Well, that's a real benefit for the long position for the buyer. But in order to get that position, we need a seller. And so the seller's profit and loss diagram is going to be the mirror image 
of this green one, and that's shown here in red. So at every point where the green trader, the long trader here, has a profit, the red will have a loss and vice versa. So you can see if the stock falls down here to 35, the long trader here in green would lose five, but the short seller would gain five. Both traders would break even at 55. That's the break even point. But look what happens as that stock price rises above that break even point at expiration. They end up with truly unlimited risk because there's no limit on how high a stock's price can rise. And because of that imbalance, that they're only going to make this small amount of premium up front from selling the option, but now they're on the hook for unlimited risk, sellers command a premium. They're not going to step into the market unless there is an expected profit. Now, of course, don't think that that means that the sellers always make a profit. That is absolutely not true. But in order to entice them into the market and to become a seller, there has to be an expected profit. And that is the volatility risk premium. So again, this is what sellers are going to demand in order to enter the market. So in the options world, we usually define the volatility risk premium as the implied volatility. You can think of that as the options price minus the realized volatility, which you can think of as the value. So as Warren Buffett once said, price is what you pay, value is what you get. And that's how it works in the options world. You're going to pay a certain volatility premium for the option. Was it a good deal or not? We don't know until we find out how much volatility was actually realized by the stock. So that's what realized volatility is. It's the volatility that actually occurred in the stock over the option's life. Yeah, you can think of that as historic volatility, but when we're talking about the volatility that is going to unfold over the option's life, we usually call that realized volatility. And so that's really the whole game. And so if you're paying implied volatility rates that are far larger than what you can expect from the stock, it is going to be a losing deal no matter how cheap the option might seem. So that's kind of the easiest way to understand why risk premiums exist in the market. But there are other ways we can look at. First of all, pricing models, such as the Black-Scholes model that I've talked about before, assume that stock prices move in small increments. In other words, there are no large gaps. So if a stock price moves from 100 to 101, it doesn't just jump there overnight. The model assumes that the seller could hedge that in very small fractions of a penny increments and always remain delta neutral. Well, we obviously know that's not true. Look at Facebook on the last earnings report where it gapped down 25% in a day. Well, the models don't account for that. And yet sellers have learned through school of hard knocks that yeah, sometimes this happens. Look at the crash of 87. Statistically would never have happened according to a pricing model, yet it did. We've had other periods that were almost equally big. So sellers have learned that yes, these moments can occur and we need to have some type of assurances on here that we can expect a profit. Another assumption of the models is that they assume that volatility remains constant through the options life. So if the stock is trading at 20% volatility today, we buy the option, the model assumes that that stock is going to stay at 20% throughout the option's life. However, we also know that's not true. Volatility moves in bursts. We can get periods of quiet volatility, and then bam, we get moments of really big volatility, just like we've seen since October. So you can think of that a little bit like down here in Florida with the insurance markets. We can go years without a hurricane, and then I think it was in 2005, we had four consecutive hurricanes, weekend after weekend, landed right here on the coast. So insurance companies realize that can happen, and they need to build in a buffer over time to account for these moments. Same thing with the option sellers here. The option sellers are not going to enter the market unless they have some type of a volatility risk premium. Let's go back over to the E-Trade platform and see this visually. For those of you using E-Trade, you can find it by going to the quote screen up here. And this graph is always permanently embedded on this screen. The orange line is the implied volatility and the blue is the historic or what we can think of as the realized. Now you can also get this by going to your chart, 
clicking on studies, down here to all studies, and over here to volatility. And we choose save, and we get the same graph down here. I'm going to use this one just because it'll be easier to see. But take a look over here. In most cases, the orange line, the implied volatility, will sit above the blue. Not in all cases, but in a lot. And that's the volatility risk premium. The difference between the orange, the volatility of the orange at this level, minus the blue. That price is what you're paying for the privilege of being the option buyer. But look at what happens over here since October. We had option sellers were commanding very large premiums. And through this period, we're actually coming out ahead. The premiums they were receiving were larger than the volatility being realized on the stock. But look what eventually happened. Option sellers were receiving these premiums down here, but ending up with realized volatility up here. They were getting crushed. They were relatively cheap for the buyers and therefore relatively expensive for the sellers. So we actually had a negative volatility risk premium. Because this can happen, and it does, you can see all through this graph, Blue's on top of orange, then orange is on top of blue, blue's on top of orange. They constantly flip-flop. Option sellers know this, and this is why they command a volatility risk premium. So that's the first thing to understand, that this has to happen in the markets, and it helps to understand why it occurs. But now let's take a look at how you, as an options trader, on a very simple level, can make sure that you're not stepping into an option that is priced with outrageously high implied volatility. Let's go back over to our Apple options here. And we saw that the 150 strike was priced at about 37%. Well, as we move to lower strikes, the extrinsic value starts to decline. And that's because that strike is more likely to become long shares of stock. And if it's more likely to become long shares of stock, then there's not much of an exercise value or a wait and see value by that strike. It's becoming more and more guaranteed to be shares of stock. And if it's more and more guaranteed, then the premium that people are going to pay to wait and see is going to decline. So let's take a look at the 130 strike right here. Extrinsic value is $1.84. Now, when I looked at the 150 strike, I compared it to the stock's price, but that's because it was slightly out of the money. With this option right here, what you're floating is the 130 strike, right? Because if you bought this option for $20.10, you could exercise it in 41 days and pay the balance of the 130 and take the stock. So that's really what you're borrowing or floating. So let's take $1.84 divided by 130, and that's going to come up to about 1.4%. But as before, we're going to annualize this. So let's take 360 divided by 41. It's going to give us about 8.8 .8, and multiply it by our premium there. And it comes up to about 12.4%. So still high, but certainly not 37%. And yes, that means that you're going to have to pay $20 for this option, but it's really not so much an option. It's becoming much more like shares of stock but you're paying $20 to control the stock instead of 148. But now as an extreme example, let's come way up here to the top, or at least near the top. Let's look at the 100 strike with 36 cents of extrinsic value. If I take 36 cents divided by the 100 strike, we get 0 0.0036. To annualize it again, 360 divided by 41, and we multiply it by that percentage, and we're going to get about 3.2%. Well, that's hardly a risk premium. That's getting more towards the cost of carry on the exercise price. That is virtually stock. But think about what you're doing. You're paying about $50 right here at the mark for stock that's worth $150. That's three to one leverage. And you've got no potential maintenance calls. You have no margin interest. This right here is far more like shares of stock. And so when you are starting out, and I'm not saying you have to go this deep in the money, but get away from the at the monies. Even though here the at the money was only, quote unquote, trading for $6, it's extremely expensive. Even if you just go a few strikes in the money, you're going to greatly start swinging the odds in your favor 
of having that option make money provided you're correct on the stock's direction. Now, having said that, sometimes people say, yeah, but if I'm wrong, I could potentially lose this $16 here. And that's true. But it makes absolutely no sense as an investor to step into a trade that has virtually a 100% chance of losing just to say that you only lost a small amount of money. And yet that's what traders do. They say, well, I'm really afraid. Let me go buy this 170 strike for 80 cents. And then they congratulate themselves for limiting the risk of saying, well, at least I only lost 80 cents. Yeah, but you were virtually guaranteed to have that happen. So even though it might appear to be a small hole, but just trust me, if you keep punching holes in your boat, you're going to sink. And so one of the ways to succeed with options is to realize that there is a volatility risk premium and move those strikes into the money to give yourself a better chance for success. If you'd like to learn more about the art and science of options trading, please check out the Alpha Trader course and Strategy Lab at optionsa-z.com. Also, please join us on the Facebook trading group Options A to Z, and you can find the link in the description below.